morning, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining this American Inspiration event presented by American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society. I'm Margaret Talkett, Director of Literary Programs at American Ancestors NEHGS and producer of this series. All of us behind the scenes are delighted you're with us tonight in the land of history, looking at the remarkable American city, Chicago, and its great fire of 1871. On your screen is the schedule for our hour-long event this evening, centered on the book, The Burning of the World, The Great Chicago Fire and the War for a City Soul by Scott W. Berg. Lucky for us, Scott will be doing an extended illustrated presentation. After that, he'll be back on screen sharing your questions, and I will be back with him sharing your questions and also just a few of my own. Thank you all for sending your queries as you registered. He addressed many of those um, in his presentation, and he'll also be addressing others in the Q&A. He'll also be looking at a few live questions with me. If you want to send us any of those for consideration, do use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Tonight's program is being produced and recorded by my colleagues in our Brew Family Learning Center. As good as tonight might be, um, this presentation and recording, of course, the real education comes from reading the book itself. The Burning of the World can be purchased from our partners at Porter Square Books in Cambridge, Massachusetts. If you'd like a signed copy for yourself or for anyone else, a favorite historian, city planner, architecture student, or commodities trader, for any of these folks, such gifts do require uh, an, the input of the code AMINTS23 in order to get a signed copy. So as you order the book online, input the code AMINTS23. I found the book thoroughly enjoyable, um, and so have reviewers over the past few weeks in the New Yorker Magazine, the Wall Street Journal, and many other publications. The, Re the Chicago Review of Books heralded, the burning of the world is a vivid character-driven history that illuminates the political machinations of the time, along with the spirit and the culture of the city. That is the background on the book. Now, moving to our formal introduction, of Scott and this event. Scott W. Berg was born and raised in the Twin Cities of Minnesota. In addition to his latest work on the Chicago Fire, he is the author of two works of narrative history, 38 Nooses, Lincoln, Little Crow, and the Beginning of the Frontier's End, and Grand Avenues, the story of Pierre Charles L'Enfant, the French visionary who designed Washington, D.C. Scott was honored with the Library of Virginia Literary Award for Nonfiction. He teaches writing, literature, and publishing at George Mason University and lives in Reston, Virginia. Scott, it is really great to have you with us. Um, I love that your formal bio starts with you being from the Twin Cities. So a Midwesterner you are, which to my mind means that at least originally you were completely Chicago centric. Um, does that sound about right? That sounds exactly right. When as soon as we, uh, my friends and I all had our driver's license, we would regularly make the six and a half hour, half hour trek. Uh, to Chicago to do any number of uh, things. But then I, I got an architecture degree at the University of Minnesota before I became a full-time writer. And during that period, we got to spend a couple weeks staying at the Palmer House and doing a really extensive study of Chicago's history and architecture. And that long ago event was kind of where all the, the germ or the kernel of all this uh, interest started. It wasn't until many years later that I got really serious about the study but yes, from way back, Chicago was our Manhattan, and to, in my, to my mind, kind of still is. Oh, that's wonderful! And you're now you're now in the Mid Atlantic, which has its charms as well. Yes. But um, I, we really thank you to, to for you taking us back to that great and bustling city in the 19th century. It is such an exciting time, and your book is a real delight. So um, over to you for more about that. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start up my. Uh, Share my screen here. Give me a second. Um, we'll just do this. I'll do this. Share screen. And then I'll go into the slideshow. And there we go. Um, I hope you're all seeing that. Uh, let me know if we're not. Um, 
So yeah, thank you, Margaret and Kelly. Uh, such a top shelf operation in this virtual world. Of, I've been really gratified uh, with um, the invitation and also the prep for this has been fantastic. Um, I believe when you're involving technology that you do a lot of prep and I can't tell you how how great it is to feel so confident and comfortable coming in. So it's um, great to be with you and great to be with all of you uh, uh, tuning in from wherever you're tuning in. One of the excitements of this, of course, is that we're, you know, you're all over and I'm all over. I just got back from six days in six cities promoting the book uh, in DC, St. Louis, uh, Chicago, Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, connecting with uh, readers and lovers of history and it's great to come back and expand that geographical map through this virtual presentation quite a bit, actually. Um, I loved my stop in the upper Midwest, and I got to talk to a bunch of people in my hometown, even, but this kind of uh, the breadth and, uh, and width of the, the reach of a, a, an event like this is fantastic. So I know a lot of you, or some of you may not know a lot about Chicago, and of course, some of you do, and I'm going to try to sort of pave a middle path and, and provide you some context of the city in 1871. And then a sense of the uh, fire and the lives involved. It's a complex story and other people have written about it. I, I take my particular tack on it and it's a very narrative tack. It's designed to sort of uh, reflect the propulsive nature of events, not just during the fire, but after the fire. Um, the aftermath of the fire is fascinating. Like the aftermath of many disasters kind of tells the story. And then I also wanna talk a little bit about uh, lives and how they're immortalized in the in the research record, um, because I know that's uh, near and dear to the hearts of the people that uh, involved in the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Um, I wanna start with uh, 30 seconds on my three books, not to promote them, but to say these three books, uh, which Margaret so kindly mentioned, uh, seem very different, but they do relate to what I'm going to talk about today. One is a story of how DC came to be. That's Grand Avenues. Another story is about at the very beginning of my home state, uh, Minnesota, when I was only four years old. Day after Christmas, 1862, 38 Dakota Indians were hanged from a single scaffold with a single cut of a rope. And it's a story of the events that led up to that. And then, of course, Burning the World, which is about the Chicago Fire, which are these very dramatic events. But what interests me is that all three both serve as endings and beginnings. And essentially become origin stories, the origin of DC, um, the origin of what you would call the uh the the um the, not only the state of Minnesota, but sort of the uh origin of um the the settling and the the closing of the frontier, both for good and for ill, right? I mean, it's a complex story there. And of course, Chicago seems like an ending, right? You know, a bunch of the city burns down. But as I'm gonna talk about the burning of Chicago. Uh, a good portion of it and, and all of its downtown becomes sort of this catalyst that um, sets Chicago on the course that it's going to follow for quite a long time, not just years, but decades and even you know more than a century. And it, in a way, Chicago also becomes a model of the modern American city um, more quickly and more abruptly than many other cities do simply because of the uh, abruptness of these events. And the, and the importance of these events. And so what I wanna start by is, because I know this is fun, when I start a project, I like to read the papers in the, in the moment before uh, this event occurs, so I can capture that real sense of irony that's there, meaning they don't know what's coming and I do. And I like to see what was in their minds uh, before I sort of talk about what happened. So I wanna paint a little bit of picture of Chicago in 1871, in October 1871, in the first week before this fire hits. Um, this is a picture of Chicago, not all of it, of course, but it's a picture of a big chunk of Chicago and it really represents a lot of what was happening in Chicago in 1871. First of all, the city in 1871 is uh, just a few decades removed from being called and being the Northwest. Um, this was where sort of, you know, at the beginning of the 19th century, in terms of settled America, Chicago was just, you know, beginning to be settled. And it, it represented sort of the northwestern edge of what would uh, of the country at that point. At the moment the city catches fire in October of 1871, the city is only 37 years old as an incorporated city. And it grew from a couple, few hundred people at that point to um, uh, 300,000 at the time of these events. And that's an enormous uh, pace of growth, as I'm sure you can imagine. And the city um, is younger, in fact, than almost all of the major historical characters that I write about and narrate in the in the book. And so most of the people 
uh, involved in the story not only are not from Chicago, but they couldn't have been Chicago because they were they're older than the city itself, which is fascinating. Chicago, unlike most of the East Coast, and certainly unlike um, the South and other places, was entirely concerned. Uh, really, it was a machine itself, Chicago, of about three hundred thousand people dedicated to one proposition. And that was moving things. They made some things there. They sold some things there. They did that. But generally what they were doing in Chicago was moving things in and out because of its position and because of the railway and transportation and, and ocean going and transportation hubs that all met in Chicago. And the three things that they moved in Chicago in 87, if you lived and this picture sort of represents a lot of it, you would move uh, livestock, you would move lumber, uh, or you would move grain. And there's a fascinating book, by the way, I always like to promote a couple other authors on the uh, on these things, just to sort of, you know, pay it backwards and forwards. And there's an amazing, amazing academic history of the hist uh, of this trade of, in lumber and livestock and grain. And it's called uh, Nature's Metropolis by William Cronin. And it's the best book of academic history I've ever read. You'd think that the trade of those three commodities wouldn't you might not make for the best story, but he does an absolutely marvelous job of it. And anyone, this was written about four decades ago, three, four decades ago, and anyone who studies or writes about Chicago owes a great debt to that book, but it's also a great expression of that sort of trade that I'm talking about. So it moved livestock, lumber, and grain. You're looking at, you know, one of the seven miles of frontage on the Chicago River of lumber yards. And you can see in this picture that you can see just piles and piles of lumber and all that lumber is floating down from Minnesota and Wisconsin and Michigan, floating down rivers and then Lake Michigan. But you can also see the giant grain elevators in the background, the tallest building in a city that would become famous for skyscrapers. It's kind of interesting to think about the fact that by far the tallest buildings in the city were these grain elevators that you can see sort of in the background of this image. Six, seven story tall grain elevators full of grain. Livestock isn't pictured here, but it came into the Union Stockyards, which are actually south of the city. But you can see all the railroad trucks cutting right across the middle of this image. Whoops, let me go back. Cutting right across the middle of this image. You can see the train yards that just ran right behind these lumber yards. And if you were in Idaho and you needed all the lumber you needed to build a town, you would order it from Chicago and they would pull the box train cars up and load it up with lumber and out it would go. Okay. And so this is a very, very busy, very, very hardworking city moving livestock, lumber, and grain, but also moving people. And people by the train load and the wagon load and the ship load. Um, it had 300,000 people in 1871, and it had, had less than half of that on 15 years earlier before the Civil War. And more than half of the people in the city in 1871, 160,000 or more are immigrants, the first-generation immigrants. And they're working 12, 14, 16 hour days, Monday through Saturday to keep all this stuff moving for the people that own the lumber yards and the people that own the grain elevators, people who own the, the, the stockyards, the union stockyards. And this influx of people like it always is, is both exciting, um, energizing, but also destabilizing up to about this point, there's been, a, there's been a steady equilibrium between workers and the people that pay them and, you know, and employ them because there's so much work in Chicago, so much to be done. It's just a perpetual machine, as I said, but the Chicago fire is about to change all of that. So when I read the papers in 1871, in October, first week of October, all of these people and the city, it's fascinating to see what they have on their minds because fire is on their mind. There are all kinds of little fires in Chicago all the time. It hadn't rained all summer and this city is built of wood basically. But the three stories, I think you'll, being a historically minded group here, I think you'll be interested in the three stories that kept coming across the uh, new, the front pages of the newspaper around the country were one, the fall of, the beginning of the fall of Boss Tweed in New York, or at least the revelations that he had in fact made himself very, 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 very rich out of his uh, machine, uh, political machine in New York. Second story that people were fascinated that got reported over and over and over again was the uh, recent arrest of Brigham Young in Utah for on charges of polygamy, which people found fascinating and sensationalistic and all kinds of things. And then the third story, which is, is you know, by far the most uh, tragic of the three, is the rise of the Ku Klux Klan in the South. And people in Chicago went about their business and they read about this almost like, a, like we would watch a horror story. Like the latest depredations in the South, the latest sort of nighttime posses, the latest sort of like um, 
burning of, of, of churches and other buildings was reported in Chicago in a very breathless sort of um, true crime kind of way. And this is what people were sort of absorbing the first week of October. Those were the kinds of stories. And then, of course, on the night of October 8th, and the book narrates this, um, the city catches fire. And it does indeed catch fire in the barn between behind Kate Leary's house. Now, Kate Leary was known to most people and referred to herself for the most was Kate Leary without the O. That was customary for a lot of recently arrived Irish immigrants. But after the fire, since it started in her house and moved to the north, after the fire, her house still stands. So I can show you a picture of her house, which otherwise would have never been entered into the historical record. And this is Catherine Leary's house, but it's only half of her house. This is on DeCoven Street. This is after the fire. Okay. Everything to the right for four miles of this, of this picture is gone. But since the wind was coming from the left of the picture from the south, her house survives because it's the barn that caught fire. The house in back to the right, this is actually two houses, two two-room sheds. The Learys were hardworking, re fairly recently arrived Irish immigrants. Kate had on this little piece of property, and there were 15 of these on her block alone, Kate had four cows and a horse and probably a few other animals as well. They owned this house. They didn't rent it. They had paid about $500 for these two houses in the front house they rented to a couple named Catherine and Patrick McLaughlin, another recently arrived. And on the night, uh, Irish uh, immigrant couple, on the night of October 8th, it's a beautiful October night, little warm, actually, like we had at the beginning of our October um, here, uh, 81, 80, 81 degrees. And Patrick McLaughlin in this front house, he's playing the fiddle. People are sitting, standing out on the sidewalks, these wooden sidewalks having quite a good time. Um, but Kate is not among them because Kate is in bed. Because as the conventional story goes, Kate was milking her cow at 9.30 and her cow kicked over a lantern and started a fire. Well, I have farm families. Pretty much nobody milks their cows at 9.30 at night. Kate milked her cows every morning at 4.30, bottled it up, and made the rounds of the West Side in Chicago to peddle her milk and made quite a good living at it. And then she would milk the cows again at about 4, 4.30 in the afternoon. And at about 7 o'clock, she would get in bed. She was tired. And this happened and, and this happened every day. And she was in bed when this happened. And then a neighbor boy who, follow along here, a neighbor boy who was quite used to using her barn to have a smoke late at night, knocks on her door at about 9.15 and says there's a fire. And there, there's your story. Pine wood, which all these houses are made out of pine wood, burns hot and light and goes up in the air really easily. And so after the barn behind this, which would have been to the right here, goes up in flames, a little piece of wood eventually rises on the updrafts of the fire, floats firemen are fighting the fire all narrated in the book and floats four blocks and lands in a church steeple well behind where the firefighters are fighting and so we have the great chicago fire begins to spread quick little map i just want to show you here those of you familiar with the geography of chicago this is the this is downtown oops sorry this is downtown chicago the chicago river north and south You'll see the Kate, the Leary's house and barn right here. The fire catches and it spreads this way, right up into downtown. It jumps over two rivers and it decimates all of downtown and then jumps to the north side and decimates almost all of the north side. 40% of the city burned because downtown was decimated in its entirety. About 55% of the wealth of Chicago vanishes because that's where the money was. And so the picture I just showed you was right here in the middle of the picture, Leary House and Barn. Then the fire starts and it begins to spread. And here's a lurid Courier and Ives print based on a, a Harper's Weekly illustration of the fire. And this is all kinds of Chicagoans fleeing across the Randolph Avenue Bridge. And there's this is actually a pretty historically accurate picture, except in one regard. It, you'll notice, if you look at this picture closely enough, that everybody is fleeing in one direction. 
And if there's one thing that was true about Chicago, even in the midst of the Great Fire, is there was always a substantial pocket of citizens who viewed fire as an entertainment and wanted to go, just like any ambulance chasers from a time immemorial, who wanted to go in the opposite direction and go and be as close to the fire as they could. Chicago had a lot of those folks. So that's the, the sort of the inaccuracy that the first part of my book narrates the fire as it jumps, it moves around. It consumes um, uh, the players are in the first part of the book are firefighters, fleeing citizens, journalists, business owners. And the fire burns for a day and a half. And again, this is a pretty good representation of it. And then about 29, 30 hours later, the fire dies out and cool. A light rain begins to fall, which is a big help. And the fire is over. And I already sort of gave you the toll of the fire. But what happens after that is that that stability I talked about within a very short period of time, that stability between all these in, this influx of immigrants and the business owners disappears. And instead of firefighters, instead of fleeing citizens, instead of journalists, so much, the people that take the stage are a whole new set of players in the city, people who have had positions of responsibility, positions of power. And it, I could spend the next half an hour talking about any one of these people individually. I could spend the next four hours talking about any of these people individually. But just a taste of the people who are featured in the book and whose lives become important to the story of the Great Chicago Fire, and especially its aftermath, are the group here, clockwise from top left, Marshall Field, the retailer. Tells the story of the, the devastation of his store, but the quick rebuilding of it and how Chicago and that really was. Joseph Medill here featured very, very in, in very large. Some of you may even have done genealogical research that brings you back to some of these names because these names are extremely um, influential and important, important in American history. Joseph Medill, who is the, the publisher of the Chicago Tribune, who then becomes mayor of Chicago and his is most interesting mayoral term probably in American history, if I had to say. So he that the story of that is in there. Third one over here, Charles C.P. Holden, the, the, the president of the city council, who ends up in a pitched battle with many of these other people for control of the city after the fire. Down here, we have Potter Palmer and his wife, Bertha Honoré Palmer, richest man in the city, America's first great merchandiser, and one of the storied may may marriages of the ages. Over here, probably a little littler than I'd like, but uh, William Butler Ogden who founded Chicago and who was living in New York when he found out that not only had Chicago, which he essentially founded, he was the first mayor and really made all of the first huge land purchases in Chicago back in 1837. William Butler Ogden has retired to New York and gets a telegram that says all of Chicago is burning. And then he gets a second telegram that says all of Peshtigo, Wisconsin, his lumber town near Green Bay, Wisconsin, is also burning on the same night. William Butler, Butler Ogden loses $4 million of wealth in one night, which is astonishing by 19th century American standards. Almost no one else in America even had $4 million, much less $4 million. And then over here in the lower left, we have Philip Sheridan or Phil Schenner or the Little General, the famous cavalry officer from the Union Army who had taken the thir third highest position in the Union Army after the war and who had chosen as his headquarters, Chicago, because he loved Chicago and felt it suited his kind of uh, rough and ready, boisterous, hard-living personality very well. And he loved living in Chicago, and it tells a story. So these players all have a major role in the political battles that happen after the Chicago fire. And the political battles are essentially between an entrenched business class, a business aristocracy that decides to use the fire as an opportunity, as many times happens in the aftermath of a disaster. And they use this as an opportunity and they uh, decide that they are going to um, make some changes that they had wished they could make before, one of which is to require that all homes within the, uh, the city limits of Chicago be built of brick forever after, 
uh, which is a problem if you're a member of the working class, because Chicago is very unique as an American city at this point in that it's not like today. Cities is back, especially Chicago back then, wasn't built in zones. The wealthy here, it factories here, a commercial area here, a business area here. It wasn't like that at all. You could live, you could be a person of very modest means living in a wood house and one block over you'd have a magnificent church and a block from that you'd have a match factory or a wood planing mill and the block over from that you'd have a giant bank building or or, or retail store. Uh, everything was jumbled together in Chicago in a way that a lot of cities are trying to imitate right now, even though they don't know they're trying to imitate Chicago. Well, a requirement to build in brick for everyone pushes 150,000 people out of the city and out into the suburbs or the south side or way up on the north side. And so for the first time in reaction to that, the working class of the Chicago says no, and they begin to do a kind of protest they've never been before, political protest. They begin to organize. And the best way to talk about that is the fact that before the fire, you couldn't get the Germans and Irish in Chicago to agree on anything, which really helped split politics in a convenient way for a lot of people. And this unites them. The second thing that unites them is the forces of prohibition, always strong in Chicago, already strong in Chicago, will continue to be strong in Chicago. The story of prohibition actually ha has a lot to do with what happens in the first part of the 20th century in Chicago. They decide that this is a good time to try to ban drinking in saloons on Sunday. Well, drinking in saloons on Sunday for the Germans and the Irish and the Czechoslovakians was not, Bohemians as they were, they were known then, was not a matter of just going to a bar on Sunday. It was their only day off, the time they talked politics, the time they talked job openings, the time they greeted relatives, the time they got together with people from their neighborhood. But the forces of prohibition come in and decide that this is when they're going to try. And the, the book narrates the reaction to that is, is loud. The reaction to that is very serious, but it's also hilarious at the same time because Chicago decides to cut loose. Much of Chicago decides that they're going to sort of only increase their use of the saloons rather than decrease them. And the book narrates that. And so that's one of the th pieces of comment. And then the third piece of, uh, of, of political friction that becomes an all out political war is the nature of relief in Chicago. Because in the wake of the fire, the leaders of the city decide to move relief out of the city's hands and into the hands of a small relief organization called the Chicago Relief and Aid Society, which does a wonderful job, but it also, as part of their wonderful job, subscribes to the tenets of scientific charity, which demands an exact measurement and evaluation of a family's situation and a serious investigation of every single person asking for aid questionnaires, house visits, references from well-known citizens. And that becomes something that a lot of people in Chicago chafe at as well. And there's this political battle. And the book sort of narrates the outcomes of that and sort of the path. That, but one person who doesn't appear on this, every single person on this sort of uh, gallery here of important people in Chicago at this point, Every single one of these people, I could have chosen any number of portraits or paintings of any of them. All of them have dozens of them. Philip Sheraton famously decorated his house with paintings, pictures, and busts of himself. So his house south on Michigan Avenue. And so this group of people, uh, you can find it. There's another incredibly important character in the story who was never photographed, but she was painted, but she was painted with no knowledge of what she looks like. And that, of course, is Kate Leary. You could buy this six weeks after the fire. This is The Origin of the Great Chicago Fire by LBH Crosby. And it is a, rep a representation that matches many of the rep representations in the Chicago papers of how the fire started. And if you're interested in how people's lives get recorded, this is a fascinating image because it's entirely wrong. No cow kicked over a lantern to begin with. Their barn was full, had room for five cows, but only, you know, only essentially um, for, uh, uh, for at night. And if you're, the cows were generally out in their backyard, there's a whole bunch of animals, no evidence they ever had a pig. 
we have an empty jug of something over here to the left. The pig is escaping the frame there on the lower left. Next to the pig is an empty jug of something. What is that supposed to, you know? There's a little bit of hay here, but in actuality, their barn contained two tons of Timothy hay, which is the good head, and two tons of wood shavings. No wonder the town burned down, right? We've got several rats trying to, you know, run along or escape up here. I don't even know if that's a rat. I assume it is. We've got, I think, a crow or whatever. We've got a, well, I, P, P, I don't know. I don't know what a lot of these, and, and so this is an entirely invented image, but you can really focus in here on Kate Leary's face because Kate Leary was a hardworking, intelligent, 44-year-old woman who is being turned into an old crone, an old Irish hag here. And this is because the city loved and all cities loved to find somebody to sort of blame for the fire. And that gets me to thinking about how people are immortalized because i know that when you're part of a genealogical group a part of genealogical society essentially what we're trying to figure out is how people are permanently entered into the historical record kate leary was illiterate she did not write english she certainly spoke it she may have been able to read it there's some evidence for that but she definitely couldn't write it so she had no way of entering sort of her own life into the historical record, except for, except for the fact of the Chicago fire. And so stuff like this comes out. Some of you may be familiar with all the old songs. There's a hot time in the old city tonight, or there's a campfire song, and I wish I could sing it for you, but there's a campfire song that I know many people, at least in Illinois and Indiana and Iowa, my parents are from Iowa. I'm from Minnesota, but my parents are from Iowa. And they would go to, my my mother would go to, back in the day, would go to Girl Scout camp and they would sing a song that they would build a big campfire and they would sing a song that ended, fire, 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 fire. They would all chant or sing fire. This is one way to enter Kate into the historical record. But the other way to enter Kate into the historical record is through her te inquiry testimony, through the fire and police inquiry in the fire and that's all in the book, too, but it is fascinating. She is grilled by five investigators, and the transcript is available, and I, I spent quite a bit of time narrating it, okay? And she's sitting in a chair with her two-year-old son in her lap, and five men are interrogating her about the fire, and it's some of the most remarkable, um, it's, it's some of the most, most remarkable testimony I've ever heard, because there's a lot of source material that establishes that she didn't start the fire, but she's being asked to explain how the fire started. And she says, I have no idea. I was in bed, but then she starts talking about her, her job, her milk peddling, her cows, the fact that she owns her land, the fact that she owns her house. And she says this all, and it's a fascinating sort of study in two sides of the coin in Chicago. And so I find her to be a really admirable character through that. And so, so this is part of the F Chicago Fire Cyclorama, also produced for the two months. This is not a literal representation of the damage, but they built a circular building right downtown. And just like there's the Gettysburg Cyclorama and some other famous cycloramas, they created a cyclorama that you could sit inside and these images would be projected on the wall. And this was the first scene. So about a month and a half after the fire, this is how Chicagoans sort of saw the decimation of the city. And the real decimation of the city wasn't too far off from this. In fact, the difference between this Im image and the actual devastation in the city is simply that there was not as much standing in the actual city. All these walls, craggy walls, weren't there. So Kate Leary was tarred, immortalized in a way she hated. But ironically, it was also that very sort of event, the Chicago fire, which came to sort of in a way determine the rest of her life. She never let herself be photographed. If reporters came to the door, she would hide her face and slam the door, never gave an interview about the fire after the events, moved several times to get away from DeCoven Street. But it's because of the fire that we know about her life at all. And I think for any genealogist, this is fascinating stuff because when I wrote my second book, of three, 38 nooses, one of the principal characters in the book is a doctor's wife named Sarah Wakefield, who was taken captive by the Dakota uh, during this U.S.-Dakota war, 
and who later on wrote a very provocative and controversial book at the time called Six Weeks in the Sioux Teepees. And because of that, we have this almost granular record of her life and what she thought and her attitudes and her moral stances and her political stances that otherwise would have never existed in the public record. And then, of course, we have Kate, whose thing, who's sort of uh, all of those things, some have to be implied. But again, reading the testimony and reading the few statements she made to friends who later on talked to newspapers, uh, gives us a sense of who is this. Otherwise, she would have been entirely invisible to history, absent from the archives. And for somebody like me writing narrative history, those are the kind of characters that fascinated who whose lives were brought forward by events. And I think any of us doing any kind of genealogical or ancestor research or just simply researching people from the past understand this, that everyday life, everyday events can provide an, uh, a window into extraordinary lives. But the opposite in this case is also true, that extraordinary events provide a fascinating window, a never endingly fascinating window into every days like Kate Larry's and her life is an important, dramatic, every immigrant life is its own individual epic. Whether they end up being Joseph Medill, a Protestant Calvinist immigrant from Ireland, or they end up being Kate Leary, a Catholic, a poor Catholic immigrant from Ireland who completely outside of her own sort of culpability ends up being at the center of this. And the way those lives are immortalized in all these different fascinations is part of what I think draws a lot of you to something like this and definitely draws me. So that's what I've got. And uh, for you, that's the last slide. We'll just stare at the devastation or I'll, or I'll stop sharing it, whatever I'm supposed to do. And uh, thank you very much for, you know, listening and, and enjoying this uh, sort of event. Scott, that is absolutely fascinating, and I love your your angle on Kate on that. Um, I have one or two quick questions, and then we have a lot of questions from folks out there um, sent in advance, and a couple of them live. Um, my uh, my question has to do with the title of the book and Frederick Law Olmsted um, sure. in the Nation magazine, um, November nine, eighteen seventy one. Um, very, I, I, he probably wrote this from Brookline, um, where he was living at the time of the fire, Brookline, Massachusetts, right outside of Boston. Sure. Um, he said, very sensible men have declared that they were fully impressed at such a time with the conviction that it was Chicago, the burning of the world. So I, you know, the existential threat of fire, can you talk about why he would say something like that? And sort of the what was happening with fires then they were like similar to terrorist attacks, weren't they? In terms well, of it, it, it's interesting. I mean, the, the, yeah, very much so. There's a lot in there. Frederick Law Olmsted, I want to say two words about him because he's the only person who has a role in all three of my books. And it's very interesting. What, an, what a life. Um, it was his son's plan for Macmillan Commission plan for D.C. in 1909 that reinvigorated Pierre L'Enfant's original plan for D.C. from way back when. And when you go to D.C. today on the National Mall, you're seeing Frederick Law Olmsted Jr.'s reimagining of Pierre L'Enfant's plan for original plan for D.C. So, I mean, that and then he's got a brief role in my second book. And then here he is. He was a journalist and a landscape architect, which is fantastic. I mean, what a combination. You know, he traveled to Chicago. I mean, he got on a, he went all over. He's famous for his writings about all of America. And so he got on a train and went to Chicago and went there. In terms of that existential threat from fire, yeah, we don't think fire today is a byproduct of other disasters, like a citywide fire, right? We still have forest fires, right? And very, very, very awful ones, Canada and, and California. But in terms of a city burning down, we've kind of we've kind of solved the problem of fire alone taking down a city. So we don't understand fire as a primary threat. We we think of fire as a secondary thing. And so this book hopefully brings back that sensation of you know, you build a city out of wood and you put only 193 firefighters for 300,000 people and only a, one engine company for 4,400 buildings. Yeah, it's bound to burn down. And I think people lived with that fear, but also weirdly that excitement, because if you didn't have a lot of money for entertainment, all the little fires that kept springing up were actually wonderful entertainment. And they were called firebugs. The people who would run to a fire 
and whoop and cheer as the firemen fought uh, fought the fire. So it's a fascinating subject, fire itself. Thanks for the question. Um, and and do go ahead and stop sharing because uh, that's sure. the image. Um, it's excellent. Yeah. But, um, yeah, no, it's a it's it uh, really? it'll we'll all have nightmares. Uh, <laughs> So it, it, it just looking quickly at Chicago, so, you know, it turned the white city, I mean, Frederick Law said and others returned, what, 20 years later for the Columbian Exposition? Mm -hmm. I mean, the city just went through, and you refer to a lot of this in your book, this sort of massive building after right. Um, and there was this incredible transfer of power away from the Protestant aristocracy and the minions around them to, you know, laborers and people who put the city forward. Just 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 shoot us forward 10, 15 years, 20 yeah. years through. Yeah. And the, the trans the, the, great question, the transfer of power um, from that sort of Protestant elite was was only a transfer of political power. They kept every bit of their financial power. The thing to say about that is. Second, the fire started cooling. Cities all over the country are promising a hundred thousand dollars each to the to the rebuilding of Chicago, Indianapolis, Boston, New York, you name it. And they weren't doing that solely out of the goodness of their hearts. If you wanted to ship goods from the East Coast to all those lucrative silver mines out in or vice versa, Chicago had to be open because there's no other way. Chicago is the hub of everything. And that talks about that. So that the political power moves away from them, but by financial power stays very, very much with them. And in fact, that becomes a bone of contention. Chicago in the 1880s becomes a very, very exciting, but also very violent and very troubling place as it's kind of the epicenter of the American battles between labor and capital kind of culminates in 1886 in the explosion of the Haymarket bomb, which is a whole different, whole nother subject, but it kind of grows out of that. And so what happens is Chicago's reputation as a city built on, you know, a big shoulders, a brawling working class city is sort of born in these moments because it's the first moment they sort of define themselves um, as a cohort, right? And so when you think about the architecture of Chicago, which you also mentioned, it's interesting. For a while, they just try to rebuild like we always do. New York is a great case study. After 9-11, there was a significant number of people who wanted to rebuild the World Trade Centers, right? Just put them right back up. But then other sort of paths were followed. And that's a very similar pattern. And so for a while, Chicago has tried to rebuild the city. But then people start coming into the city. People like Louis Sullivan, the architect, who's only like 17 at the time of the fire, arrives in the city and says to himself, already full of a sense of his own destiny as an architect, even at 17, says, this is the place for me. And eventually, Louis Sullivan, Daniel Burnham, several architects, within a, not so many years, are responsible for the first skyscraper, these amazing buildings, this innovation in American architecture. And of course, Louis Sullivan ends up mentoring who? Frank Lloyd Wright, who becomes sort of emblematic of Chicago. Frank Lloyd Wright's life is another story, several great biographies that was dramatic and not always great, but his art, art was unbelievable and just a great story by himself. But, you know, I first came to know Chicago really through the architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright. And so I love creating those little connect the dots all the way back to this event. Fascinating. Um, moving now to people's questions. Um, sure. So many good ones. Was the, you sort of answered this, but no, was the Chicago fire a national story at the time? It was and an international story. Because the other piece of this, which I didn't get to talk about, was that, that while the telegraph had been around for quite a while, the first telegraph line started to run in and out of Chicago in 1848. But the truly national and international telegraph system did not sort of lock into place until after the Civil War. So we're talking. And so just put put this in, in mind. The first undersea internet inter whatever you call it, intercontinental cross-Atlantic telegraph cable was run to Ireland in 1866, five years before this. And this is the first huge American story in terms of like a disaster to hit in those five years. Obviously, Abraham Lincoln's assassination would have been the previous big story, but that's a year before it runs overseas, okay? And so the news spreads in a day, and we're not just talking to New York and, you know, Nevada, and we're not just talking all these places. We're talking to Ireland and the Ireland to England and to Europe, and yes, to India and other places farther away. This is absolutely one of the very first global media sensations. And there's some things about that in, in, in my book, but it's kind of worth a whole study by itself. 
because I didn't, in the scope of my book, I didn't have a chance to talk about how this played in every place it went to, but oh my, was it an international story. And, and what you do point out is how completely different the story was in Chicago versus yes. in New York versus one was a story of resilience and the other's a story of, oh my, they're completely wiped out. Yes. Um, and uh, that difference is the, the discretion of different publishers. How does that story get to be so completely different? Well, I mean, it has to do with. Uh, so even before the fire has cooled, Joseph Medill, who's operating at that point before he becomes mayor, he's operating as one, one of the publishers of the Chicago Tribune. And I, I have a set piece in my book where Joseph Medill runs downtown and tries unsuccessfully to save the Tribune building, but it's full of dramatic twists and turns. But even before it's done, they're talking about Pompeii. They're talking about the burning of London. And Chicago has always had a, you know, second city mentality. Like, like, and this is not, I'm not saying anything new there, which is, is this desire to sort of raise the level of what happened there to the story of a world historical event. And so when all this is going out on the wires, it's not saying 40% of Chicago burned, da, 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 da. it's saying Chicago is gone. And part of that is just because of the panic and the and the fear. And the, I mean, it seemed like all of Chicago was gone. OK. And all of downtown Chicago was gone where they're sending, you know. So so it seems like Chicago is gone. But also there's that sort of self mythologizing already happening. And then, you know, this I could spend. In fact, I did this in St. Paul when I was home. I could spend a night telling you about two events, the tornado of 1984, which compared to Oklahoma tornadoes was nothing, but was very dramatic for us. But especially our Halloween blizzard of eight uh, of, of 1991, we had 29 inches of snow on Halloween. And don't you forget it, because even in Chicago and even out there in Boston, you people don't know what it's like to get 29 inches of snow on Halloween. Literally, I'm not joking. And, and and so that mentality that all cities have to sort of claim was already in operation in Chicago when they're sending the news out. And yes, the third piece of that, probably they had some awareness that the bigger they painted the disaster, the more help they might get from other cities. So there's a bit of like we all do, like, you know, exaggerating the issue so more people run to our aid. Do I think that was the main thing? No. Do I think there was a little bit of that in there? Yeah. Lots and lots of questions about various um, recent immigrant groups. And I'll just read a few. Oh, of them. sure. Uh, just let me get through a couple. What was the impact on the Irish community? Um, did Scandinavian immigrants cluster in specific areas of Chicago? Uh, my ancestor lived on this street. Um, mm -hmm. Have you found anything on the Dutch immigrants and how they were impacted by the fire? Um, what about my German relatives? Uh, so yes, just a little bit more. Yeah. Pain. So what, what happens is that, is that, that the, like the Leary's neighborhood was called, I'm going to try to give you the very short answer. The Leary's neighborhood was called an Irish neighborhood, but even I saw talk about this in the book, but there's Vanix on their street. There's, there's other, there's, there's, um, Schmitz on their street. There's all these other names in the Leary's name. You just have to look in the city directory. So the city was very much a mix of ethnicities, but they kind of operate in broad strokes on the upper, on the north side toward the, the river on the, this, on the west side of the north side, I know it's a little confusing, but are where a lot of the middle-class Germans populated. The west side, lower west side was where a lot of the, 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 the poorer Irish, um, there were, there were some flat out slums south of the city. There were areas of Bohemians, but really at this point, the, Nor the Scandinavian influx had only sort of it had begun, but it was it was a they were a much smaller group. The dominant groups were the Irish, the German, and to a lesser degree the Bohemians. And what happened to all of them? Well, these are the groups. I I, I know you know read the book. I keep probably you know that's what 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 I keep saying. But but to make a story short, is these groups start to form a single po political coalition. And the rebuild goes wonderfully for most of them, okay? The rebuild for all of them, it was actually a surprisingly, unless you were, you know, had lost somebody, which was, a, which was a, you know, maybe a thousand people total at most, unless you lost somebody, um, the rebuild went quickly. And why? Because the city rebuilt so quickly and the, within a week you could get getting work. So if I'm a I'm a German saloon keeper, I'm rebuilding my saloon because all these new workers in town coming in and and if I'm a if I'm a 
uh, bohemian uh, laborer, like I got work the next day practically because either clearing away or starting to build something new. The speed of the rebuild determined that some of these immigrants' lives within about six months were almost back to normal. The only concern, Margaret, which is, I love this question, the only concern is everybody else around the country thought to themselves, hmm, there's going to be work in Chicago. And the book narrates this, but one of the things that your ancestors, if they're German or Irish or Bohemian or or New had to deal with was a whole bunch of new people coming in, kind of trying to take your jobs. And that was probably their concern more than anything. Like is, I want my job back. I want my job back at the old level of pay. For most of them, it happened, but it didn't happen without a lot of sort of political awareness and even a fight. Lots of questions about records. And let me just read a couple of them quickly. Uh, how can I find records of businesses burned? E, um, I'm particularly interested in a saloon. Uh, another one is what records survived? And then online, um, we have uh, my great grandfather probably perished in this fire. The cabinetry shop was located in the South area. Uh, one son who worked there was uh, under doctor care. Um, I have not found any info in hunting missing persons or lost in the fire. Again, a record questions. Where would you suggest looking? Well, I would suggest making a trek to the Chicago History Museum and their records because they have, and honestly, I have to tell you, they have a complete run of the city directories. And I would start with the city directories. They're called, the best ones are called the Edwards Printing Company, but they're called the Edwards uh, 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 City Directories. And they have, and I, not, it's funny you ask this question because now I have to sort of say, I leaned on that Edwards City Directory for 1871 like I've never leaned on a document because it has um you can get it online I don't have the link you know right here because I downloaded it as a PDF but you can get it online and if it's PDF it's entirely searchable and the search is kind of reliable sometimes you know the the image is bad or the names are misspelled a lot, but um, you've got the city directories, but a run of city directories, and then they have all kinds of different directories. And that can help you locate a saloon pretty easily if you're willing to search for sort of other, um, because in the back of the city director, saloons, shoo, all the saloons. And by the way, there were 3,000 of them in the city. It's not even one eight block stretch. I learned this from the city director sitting in the Chicago history. Room. One eight block stretch from the river to the lake in downtown of Randolph Avenue, eight long city blocks like in New York, 300 saloons. Tells you a lot about Chicago. I, I'm trying to do the math on that and I've verified it. And so, but, um, but the Chicago history museum is wonderful. I would start with the city directories. Um, I find those to be just absolutely marvelous. And I mentioned the Edwards directory, but there are multiple others. There's also something called the Sanborn insurance maps, which help you sort of place houses very specifically on streets. Those are available, I think for free. Oh, I, I, I think it's, you don't have to pay for them through the Boston Athenaeum, I believe, but I'd be happy to have, you know, send anybody the information in terms of sending it to Margaret and she can send it out. But those kind of questions, yeah, you can do that investigation. Also, finally, the ProQuest Chicago Tribune, which you can use in the Chicago History Library or subscribe to, entirely searchable during this whole time. And for instance, in the week after, they just listed all the businesses that were burned down. Did they miss some? Sure. But they, there's an enormous list in the Chicago Tribune for the next month or so. And there's all kinds of lists of the dead. But the problem is the lists of the dead and missing might call somebody like George H. with just the initials. So it's always a bunch of detective work. But yeah, I, I'm answering this at some length because you, we're, the, we're very much in the same zone. Do you, do you know of any another question, Chicago Relief Society records? I mean, there must have been a, mut a lot of mutual aid. Oh, yeah. No, no. You can find yeah. those at the... Chicago history record and sometimes through archive.org or something, but they they had to do an annual report and, and the Chicago relief and aid society annual report. You can either get them at the history uh, museum, their library, or if you go to like archive.org and just search Chicago relief and aid and start putting in years, 1871, 1873, they would do a report every year and their reports after the, the, the fire. Also, since you asked that question, Margaret, do whatever you can to access uh, the Andreas 
uh, that's the last name, the three volume history of Chicago. The second volume is where the fire mostly is, but because what Andreas does is he writes these big, and again, you can get the physical copies at the Chicago History Museum, but he writes these big, beautiful books in, later in the 1800s that are illustrated, but he, a lot of the history that he writes, quote unquote history, is just transcriptions of primary sources. And so, for instance, he's got a really great record of the entire political fight over the Relief Society in his um, books. But yeah, I, I really appreciate these questions. I hate to keep saying Chicago History Museum, but they're great. And the people, library is great. We all need to go there. So yeah. And the Newberry. I mean, but yeah. they don't have quite this kind of stuff. Now, a lot of folks are interested in your personal opinion about the Peshtigo fire and whether there was any synergy between these fires. Oh, it, it's meteorological. No, thank you. Peshtigo fire is up in Wisconsin and it burns down the same day as Chicago fire. And then there's another fire um, close by that also starts and, and is uh, uh, fairly devastating. And it's all people have always wondered. People of the day said, was it a comet? Was it, in, was it arsonist? Was it whatever that did this all on the same night? But meteorology explains it because the missing piece of the coincidence of Chicago and Peshtigo catching fire is that if, you, if you're paying attention to what's happening in the upper Midwest, for about a month, most of Minnesota and portions of Wisconsin have been on fire already. They're, they're, th those are very, very, very wooded states. And they are burning, 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 just like Canada was burning, you know, a while back. And, and so just millions of acres burning. The other thing is that the the meteorological conditions were such that the barometer and everything else were, were this week was unusually dry in a summer where they hadn't had rain since really the end of June. And so it's one of those things where you know how when they put out a code red for a fire, it's like, how do they know today? Well, they knew then. And in, in those days, and that day just happened to be a very, 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 very meteorologically dangerous day. It's not that weird. I have actually a little section in the book about it, and and but but it's not that weird because other things were already on fire. Other things caught fire. So if you fit Chicago and Peshtigo into the overall situation that's been going on for weeks, it's it reads more like a coincidence and less like something that was cosmic or faded or whatever. It's a yeah, great it's, question, but the, the world Smokey was very dry on that day. Yeah, anyway. before Smokey the Bear had his sign, fire danger exactly. high. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Going on. Um, a couple quick questions. Uh, there's a question about. Uh, Kate Lear, uh, Kate Leary's descendants, which um, Scott's going to get to in um, in his reading in a, just a moment. Yeah, the the, the, Leer, the Leary descendants, um, because be, because a lot of people have already talked to the Leary descendants and gotten not much. She had a lot of descendants, and but they 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 they've been questioned ad infinitum about the fire. And we're starting to deal with how many generations away. So I didn't pursue them, but I do have a section I'm going to read. Um, there is no sense of any, and they're, by the way, they're back to the O'Leary's because Leary was the assimila assimilationist move with your name. You wanted to Americanize, but as soon as these political fights uh, uh, sort of reached their apex, then a lot of Irish put the Mick and the uh, O back on their name. So they they would be O'Leary's today for the most part, but they're spread they're spread all over. And and I, I wish I could tell you that I interviewed a great 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 granddaughter and that they had a secret, but no, there's a lot of good work on them already. And the work basically says um, they're not talking. And I, I chose to sort of respect that because that wasn't really the full. If I was doing this for an article for like. The Atlantic, I think I would go try to talk to somebody, but for my book, it wasn't necessary, but it's a great I, question. I don't, I don't miss it in the book. So yeah, I, I don't really either. appreciate the passage you're going to read. Um, just quickly, one very kind person said that um, the Library of Congress has the Sanborn fire insurance maps. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. The San, yes. And, and to get those. Uh, I'm not sure if they have them online yet. Like the, the ones I think from the Athenaeum, I think you can search and then you can get these beautiful high res images and zoom in on different blocks. I'm not sure the LLC's done that yet, but they may have, they're digitizing an amazing stuff at an amazing rate there. So that's the kind of thing is, is, you know, looking at maps and there's a bunch of other map providers. I know a lot of, you know, about. maybe they have, but the Sanborn insurance maps, I guess this is the last thing I'll say about that is if, if you know what I'm talking about or are interested in sort of cities, 
then this is interesting otherwise not so much but they are glorious because they're so granular down to like street level because they had to be they had to record what kind of business was there and you know and what how, what size the building was and where the entrances were so they're just so much fun i have a huge file of them on my computer but yeah i'm glad to know that about the library of congress a last um a question some sure. street names and numbers have changed since 1871 yes. is there a way to map of the addresses where the higher the fires burn? not any not anything i know and sadly no it's very difficult to map Chicago, uh, old Chicago onto new Chicago. It, downtown, it's easy in the loop. You can do it, but um, you you really just have to rely on, uh, and also the, it's not just the numbers have changed on the streets that still do exist, is that they changed quite a few times. They kept renumbering the streets every so often. And so you don't even know if what you're reading in it 10 years later after 1871 is helpful. So I hate to be saying, being so unhelpful on these things, but that's, you know, as you all know, that's kind of the story of this kind of research is you get what you can get and then try to be dogged about the rest. And again, talk to the people who who know, but I've talked to a lot of people in Chicago who who contradict each other too on this kind of stuff. So I always have to be a little careful that just because I hear something that sounds convincing that I corroborate it with somebody else. So it's it's a process. It takes a while, but a good question. I wanted to to leave folks, uh, we'll go brief, quickly to your reading, but I just wanted to leave folks and get your comment on the thought that uh, in the book, you talk about this being a huge polyglot, polyethnic city. Oh, Absolutely. And more international in spirit, more languages than either New York or London at that mm -hmm. time is what you say in the book, which is really remarkable statement about our Midwestern, Northwestern city at that time. I mean, that's it's all. Yeah, true. And, and the statement, just to make sure I'm being clear about so I don't have any New York historians saying um, the sheer numbers, Chicago didn't match New York. But what but the pace of immigration was higher than it's probably been anywhere else. I mean, these people you know this these these various peoples had come and you know my ancestors few of my ancestors were among them had come and the pace that they're settling is just absolutely from 40,000 to 80,000 and and 10 sometimes as many as 10,000 a year so so Chicago felt like it because the city that had one character just a few years earlier suddenly um and this in America you know what happens here any influx of immigrants always comes with sort of these this friction. And in Chicago, that friction hadn't quite yet burst out in the Chicago fire, but after it was ready to do so. And so I'm the, the feel of Chicago and the sheer numbers and the sheer percentage growth has never been matched. Fascinating. Um, we really thank you, Scott. We have oh, learned so much. I've learned so much. And as we do for all our authors in the American Inspiration Series, we've asked Scott to read from The Burning of the World. So, um, Scott, back to you for that. If you if you have energy, we're, we're ready. No, yeah. And it's a short passage. Um, but I think to me, it's kind of at the heart of the book. I talked about how lives get immortalized and lives get immortalized through myth. Lives get immortalized through records, ledgers, through diaries. Lives get get immortalized through inquiry testimony lives get immortalized through paintings like i showed you with kate leary but another way that lives get immortalized which i think all of you can connect to very significantly is simply through our ancestors or our descendants you know, depending on which way you're looking from simply through our descendants and i have a passage in here about how one of uh kate's descendants um takes a significant role of immortalizing her in one way but diminishing her infamy in another way. And I find it fascinating. So I'll read that to you. In one important way, Kate Leary, this is after she disappeared from public view after the inquiry. But in one important way, Kate Leary was still to make a lasting contribution to the public life and, and inimitable style of the city. Two years old on the day of the fire, her son, James Patrick O'Leary, the boy who sat on Kate's lap during the commissioner's interrogation, went on to live a life that was as stereotypically and perhaps prototypically Chicago when as could be. While still in his teens, Jim ran tickets and bets for bookies before he set out to learn the ropes of the gambling business at his own book at an off-track site near Indianapolis. By the time he was 24, he was back in Chicago, owner of a saloon on Halstead Street, half a mile from DeCoven, that featured a restaurant, a bowling alley, a billiards parlor, and a Turkish bath for good measure. His customers and fellow saloon owners started to call him Big Jim in honor of his personality and his physical heft. And indeed, the latter part of Jim's life was straight out of a silent film, 
fitted between the Chicago of the Great Fire and the Chicago of Al Capone. He ran an amusement park, a floating gambling emporium, several drugstores and other businesses, some upstanding and some not so legal, many of which lasted for only a short time. He was accused of a murder, but never charged. He never spent a day in jail, although one or another of his gambling halls was every so often shut down by the police for the sake of appearances. He was the very public life of a full-bellied, hide-spirited man. Big Jim loved to tell stories of gamblers with the greatest of nerve, or of big losses on big bets, or of narrow escapes from the law. He was a philosophical man, and a philo 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 philanthropic man, sorry. Philanthropic one, armed with a raucous sense of humor and a booming laugh that made him beloved of his customers. He was fiercely loyal to the poorer neighborhoods, the places that produce the kinds of people who work the city's lumber yards, stockyards, its slips and docks, its grain elevators. As he told the Tribune in, the, in an interview long after the Great Fire, quote, it is often the piker that shows the real grit. This is so Chicago in this language. The little he bets is all he has. And when he loses without whining, he is showing nerve, but you might never know it. Nerve and pluck are funny propositions. They get by you even when you're looking for them. I know because I've seen them go by. Unquote. In the way of many a gambling impresario, gregarious Big Jim was always ready with a tale, sometimes tall, sometimes true. But Big Jim never spoke about his parents and the great fire other than to tell a single reporter on a single occasion decades afterwards that his parents had, quote, often told him the story about the cow and the lamp was a monumental fake, unquote. One might, without much of a stretch, conclude that Big Jim made a legend out of his own life in order to push aside the one imposed on his mother. The effort wasn't entirely successful, but during his lifetime, he came close enough to effacing his mother's notoriety that most of his obituaries mentioned the great fire only in passing. Like Kate Leary before him, Big Jim refused to give in to a city that wanted his family to stand in as a simple answer to questions that were, in the end, endlessly complex. Thank you, Scott, for taking us back through so many facets of urban history and lore and exposing the complexity of our country, of immigrants, and also just the simple truth about families, about family loyalty and carrying on. Um, Chicago is such an inspiring city to so many of us, and that goes back quite a ways, obviously. Yes. Um, your book is full of insights into really what was a transformational time in history. So a reminder to our audience, The Burning of the World is available from our partners at Porter Square Books in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, if you'd like a signed copy for yourself or for worthy, gritty people on your holiday gift list, do input the code AMINS, like American Inspiration, 23 as you order. Uh, the bookstore can take care of shipments on your behalf anywhere in the United States. We at American Ancestors NEHGS are delighted you joined us tonight. If you're researching a time in history, a person or a family, we are here to help. Free to the public, you can chat with one of our genealogists seven days a week. And our Brew Family Learning Center hosts many educational programs providing skills for family historians. Members can access digital archives, including 1.4 billion searchable records any time of day or night. As you can see in the programs on screen now, we share insights and research tips on all times and places that make up America's history. Of particular note, the World Wars course highlighted on the top here features American inspiration authors, Adam Hochschild and Matthew F. Delmont, along with Professor Burke Blower and our star genealogist, David Allen Lambert. We hope you will let, let them help you discover and tell your family's World War story. Our experts traveling with you to Salt Lake City are also true pros at uncovering family information out there in those records. The mission in all they do and in all we do is to educate, inspire, and to connect you. Um, in addition to the Salt Lake opportunity, we have another in-person opportunity here in Boston. On October 26th, we'll be honoring Drew Gilpin Faust, the 28th president of Harvard, the celebrated historian and author, most recently of Necessary Troubles, Growing Up Mid-Century, the New York Times bestseller. 
At this benefit dinner at the Harvard Club in Boston's Back Bay, she'll be in dialogue with Deval Patrick, the former governor of Massachusetts. Don't miss hearing from these two leaders and celebrating particularly Dr. Faust's many contributions. Um, for all of you back in the virtual world, you book lovers, you history lovers, on October 17, we're welcoming Steve Inskeep, the NPR reporter, author and historian. Mr. Inskeep will discuss his new book, Differ We Must, How Lincoln Succeeded in a Divided America, with moderators Ryan J. Woods of American Ancestors, NEHGS, and Catherine Algor of Massachusetts Historical Society. The threesome will talk also about writing history, what it means to record information, how and why to do it. This is a topic that Ryan and Catherine have discussed with other historians in the series, including Nathaniel Philbrick, H.W. Brand, Stacey Schiff, and others. Don't miss this next session in this Best Love series. On November 6, our Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center will present author Rebecca Claren with her new book, The Cost of Free Land, Jews, Lakota, and the American Inheritance. And on November 7th, we're offering another event in partnership, this time with the fabulous Charleston Literary Festival out of South Carolina. Margaret Atwood will be discussing her new collection of short stories about families, marriages, and more. That book is called Old Babes in the Wood. This is a work of fiction, but the stories relate to all of us and to our families, so don't miss that. But first, again, Stephen Skeep next week discussing the genius of President Lincoln, history and writing. But back to tonight, thank you, Scott, for sharing your insights on Chicago. It's past and it's present. Um, I really enjoyed your book and I enjoyed this evening. And to the audience out there in Zoom land, thank you. We appreciate your interest in America's history, coast to coast and across all its people. We wish you a good evening wherever you are and we hope that you will join us again. Good night, Scott, and good night, everyone out there. Thank you all. <laughs>